Hello, I'm Sid Roth. Welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. Have you ever heard of a man by the name of William Branham? He had, without a doubt, since the days that Jesus walked in the flesh, the greatest miracle ministry I ever read about. There's no guesswork on his part. He knew when people were going to be healed. He never missed. William Branham. Well, how much time do you have? To William Branham uh, was born not too far from Abraham Lincoln was born in Kentucky, about 100 years apart. They were both born in a log cabin. Uh, Branham's parents were teenagers when he was born. And they were bo he was born in a, in a single room log cabin. After he was born, they cleaned him up and laid him in a crib. And a light came from the sky through the woods, the parents said, and came through the only window in the little cabin where the parents lived and came over and sat down or lighted upon the little baby. And it was William Branham. And that's how God told his parents that he was a special child. Uh, so that's how Branham's life began. And that would give a tone to what it would be yeah. like throughout his life. He was probably the greatest prophetic gift in the last few hundred years in church history. His ability was given to him in 1947, 48, in that time period by an angel that came from, the, from heaven. And that's when he was out in the woods. Out right? in the woods, yeah. Yeah, in the trees. The, the story is the angel appeared to him and said, I've been sent from the throne of God, direct quote, to tell you you've been given two gifts by which you will minister and so forth. The first gift is to know the secrets of men's hearts. The second is to be able to do signs and wonders to confirm that that which you've said is true. Da, 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 da. And so the, the prophetic gift of Branham and the way maybe other prophetic people operate today was Branham's gift was residential, where prophetic gifts usually flow more consistent with the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, so that's why I would separate or make a differentiation between his uniqueness and the normal prophetic operations of the day. So when somebody says a person has a gift like Brother Branham, I don't quite swallow that because his was unique that it was residential. So to explain even this way, uh, Gordon, not Gordon, but Demas Shakarian was a friend of mine toward the end of his life. And him and Brother Branham were close. So I asked Demas Shakarian, what, what was Branham like and what was your conversations? And one thing that Demas said was he asked Brother Branham one time, how do you see all these things about people? Because he could walk in this room, know everybody's name, what you had for lunch, what your wife was doing, where your kids were, and talk to you like they were part of your family, and it's all through that gift. And Brother Bradham said, it's like this. He goes, there's a wall in front of me, and I just pull myself up above it, and as long as I'm above, I can see everything I need to see and talk about. When I get tired, I come down below beside the wall. And that's how he explained how his gift worked. And uh, Gordon Lindsay wrote, they never knew Brother Bradham to miss it in his experience with him, which is a pretty high regard. Right. And uh, so, Brother Branham um, had a lot of uh, visitational things with angels. He had uh, the glory cloud or degrees of glory manifestations, the halo, the light around him, which are what I would call presence of God manifestations. Uh, there's a story about, and I've heard the cassette of the power of God hit the, the stage one night in a Branham meeting, and the piano player fell off the piano bench, but the piano kept playing. Mm. And you know, unique. Well, things like that, yeah, that that's right. thousands saw. So it wasn't just a few that were making up. Thousands saw this. Right. And so these are things that people, it's, it's, a, it's a legitimate recording of what happened. A woman dropped dead in Brother Branham's meeting. And one of all Robert's men, a doctor, was there, one of the highest men in all Robert's. He'd come over and said, Brother Branham, she's passed on. Brother Branham says, be patient. Be still, Mary, and I'll jump Mary. Okay, man, I seen that with my eyes. That was, that was, that, that was the fifth one. Right after that, Gordon Lindsay brought Brother Branham to Portland, Oregon. E logo depois disso, Gordon Lindsay trouxe o irmão Branham para Portland, em Oregon. In the big city auditorium that seats 8,000 people. Em um grande auditório da cidade que cabiam 8 mil pessoas. We sat in the third balcony. E nós sentamos na terceira galeria. This gentle little man came out on the platform. E este homem pequeno e gentil chegou na plataforma. He was like Christ to me. 
Ele era como Cristo para mim. He spoke very careful. Ele falava com muito cuidado. Se você conhece esse nome, esqueça as coisas estúpidas que aconteceram anos depois. But at the time that I knew him, Mas na época que eu conheci ele, he represented Christ to me. ele representou Cristo para mim. He preached tender, ele pregou suave, but firm. Mas firme. And when he got through preaching, e quando ele terminou de pregar, hundreds of people came and accepted Christ. Centenas de pessoas vieram e aceitaram Jesus. I wanted to be able to do that. Eu queria ser capaz de fazer aquilo. Then he called for the sick. Depois ele fez um apelo aos enfermos. Marvelous miracles took place as we watched. E milagres maravilhosos aconteceram e nós vimos. I had my second vision. Eu tive a minha segunda visão. I saw Jesus in that man. Eu vi Jesus Cristo naquele homem. I haven't got time to tell you all that happened. Eu não tenho tempo para te dizer tudo o que aconteceu ali. There was a girl that was born deaf and dumb. Mas havia uma garota que nasceu surda e muda. Remember now, I was a noise-making Pentecostal. E lembre-se, eu era um pentecostal barulhento. We were scared of devils. E nós tínhamos medo dos demônios. And if we thought someone had a devil, e se a gente imaginasse que alguém tinha um demônio, we were very careful. a gente ia ter muito cuidado. And the best we could do is yell at e o melhor que eu podia fazer era gritar com o demônio. And gang up on them. E lutar com eles. And the more noise e quanto we made, mais barulho a gente fazia, the more, the greater the possibility maybe they would go. maior a possibilidade de talvez o diabo sair. I was a noise maker. Eu era um barulhento. I could tell you some funny stories about that. E eu posso te contar histórias engraçadas sobre isso. This man pulled this little girl to his side. Mas este pregador puxou aquela garota para perto dele. Like a father. Como um pai. And he spoke so kind to the people. E ele falava tão suave para as pessoas. He said, "Please bow your head while we pray for the child." E ele disse, "Por favor, curve a sua cabeça enquanto vamos orar por esta criança." So we did. E nós fizemos isso. I was ready to do business. Eu estava pronto para fazer alguma coisa. I'm telling you, he needed me. Eu te digo, ele precisava de mim. This was a big deal. Isto era um grande negócio. I mean, I had never, I had never tackled a deaf and dumb devil. Eu nunca havia atacado um demônio de surdez antes. This is a serious challenge. Isto era um desafio grande. So you imagine how I'm revving up. Então você imagine como eu estava wow. ali todo reverente. Uh, you know, this is going to be a big thing. Porque eu acho que isso vai ser uma grande coisa. This man. E este homem. I'll never forget his prayer. Eu nunca vou esquecer da oração que ele fez. Just quiet. Ele era calmo. But firm. Mas firme. He said, "Thou dumb and deaf spirit." Ele disse espírito surdo e mudo. Eu te repreendo em nome de Jesus Cristo de Nazaré. Leave the child. Saia dessa criança. And enter her no more. E não entre nela nunca mais. Silence. Silêncio. Wow, I was Uau, eu estava me tremendo. We're work on this deal now. Nós vamos trabalhar com isso agora. And you know what he did? E sabe o que, é que ele fez? I was shocked. Eu fiquei chocado. He said, "Audience." Ele disse, "Audiência." You can lift your heads now. Você pode levantar a cabeça agora. The evil spirit has left the child. O espírito mal já deixou a criança. And she's well. Ela está bem. I thought, "How do you know?" E eu pensei, "Como que ele sabe?" We ain't even made noise yet. A gente nem começou a fazer barulho ainda. How? Oh, that girl was healed. Aquela garota foi curada. I saw Jesus in that man. Eu vi Jesus naquele homem. But believe me, my friend. Acredite em mim, meus amigos. This gospel works. Este evangelho funciona. How big can possible be in you? De que tamanho o possível pode estar em você? Stretch. Estique. Stretch. Estique. Reach out. Alcance. Only believe. Apenas creia. All things are possible. Todas as coisas são possíveis. If you can only believe. Se você apenas crê. God says. Deus disse. Because I love you. Porque eu amo você. You're my choice. Você é meu escolhido. I am with you. Eu estou com vocês. I'll never leave you. Eu nunca vou te deixar. May it be so in your life. E que seja assim na sua vida. In the name of Jesus Christ. No nome de Jesus Cristo. Hallelujah. Aleluia. Amen. Amém. This message is everything to me. It's perfect. And may God encourage your heart to stay with it. There's things we don't understand, but remember, if God thought it, Brother Branham spoke it. 
we believe it and that settles it. And I was thinking the other day and I woke up and when I was just a little boy, I was about 12 years old. And we was over in a little town called Vandalia, Illinois. And Brother Brandon was having a tent meeting. And we stayed in a little cheap hotel. And I say that to go with my testimony here. And I know you've probably heard me give this testimony, but maybe just one more time I want to share it with you because it's one of the greatest experiences of my life. And in this room, it didn't even have a bathroom. The bathroom was down the hall and we just had a wash basin right where the camera is here. And it was just a little wash basin and a little pitcher and that's where we'd wash our hands and things. When we had to take a shower, take a bath, we'd go down at the end of the hall. And I used to sell, in the meetings, I had a little apron and I'd go down and I'd sell the little books. There was three books Brother Branham had. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Divine healing in, healing in the campaigns. And I thought I was something. Get out there and sell those books. And Daddy would always, and I'd see the, the Lord move in the meetings. And as a kid, he'd tell us about these things and how the angel would meet him. And I remember one night, in this hotel room we were sitting there and my dad's brother was working with us at that time he was driving a truck and his name was Donnie and he was the youngest of the brothers and he and I and dad were sleeping in the same room and I don't remember I know dad says on tape that he that he took a pillow and throwed it over and woke me up all I remember I woke up was a pillow across my face and he had this pillow across my face and he says Paul I said, yes, sir. It was about two o'clock in the morning. And he says, you know the angel that daddy talks about? I said, yes, sir. And he said, he visited me tonight and was telling me some things and about the meetings and how to conduct the meetings and what was going to happen. And I said, yes, sir. And he still had the pillow across my face. And he says, and I asked him, could I wake you up? And could I wake up my brother Donnie? And he said, the angel said, you can wake up Billy. And he says, and he says, can he see you? And the angel said, yes. He said, <clears throat> excuse me. He says, when dad, <clears throat> when dad takes this pillow from your face, he says, you know where the wash basin is over there? And I said, yes, sir. He said, he'll be standing there and you can see him. And I said, okay. You remember, I was just 12 years old. And he took a pillow from my face and I thought it'd be an angel with wings flying around, but it wasn't like that. There stood a man in that room dressed in pure white. And he had his arms folded like this, hair down to his shoulders. He just stood there. One thing it reminded, it was so outstanding to me. He never spoke a word. But he'd look around the room, but his eyes was totally focused on my dad. Every move was watching my dad. And I can see those, I can see him yet now, them eyes just going around the room. He'd look at me and he'd look over at my uncle, he'd look back around like that. He'd move his head a little bit, but his eyes never left daddy's eyes. And I grabbed daddy, because I, I didn't know, it was a man standing in the room over by the window. And, and he, and I'll never forget daddy told me, he said, don't be scared, son. He said, he sent from the presence of Almighty God. And he says, he won't harm you. He says, he'll be a blessing. Now watching, he just held real close, and Daddy held me. And he went from that being of a man, just as Brother Bram describes him, into, I'm not gonna say a pillar of fire. It was like a mist, a light, a vapor. He just kind of vanished and he went out the window, right out the room like that. And when he left, a rainbow come right in the same window and hung in that room for hours at midnight, two o'clock in the morning, dark room, but he stood there and that pillow, or excuse me, that rainbow stayed in the room. I felt a presence and I asked my dad later, I said, why did that happen? And he says, he said, because I wanted you to see him he said, God called you to work with me, Billy, and I want you to see him and to know what Daddy was telling you was the truth. Not that I doubt it, but it was just such an experience, such a wonderful experience. 
You know, all through my life, I, I traveled, and my job was to get Daddy in and out of the meetings. And, you know, sometimes I'd let him stay too long, and sometimes I'd take him too quick. And, you know, I just, young boy, but I kept doing what he said. And I'd give out the prayer cards, and I'd bring the people up to him. And sometimes I'd let him stay too long, and he'd say, Billy, you let me stay too long tonight. He says, he says, Tomorrow night, you don't give out prayer cards because Dad's too tired. Well, I'd go home and I'd cry. I'd be so upset because I messed up the next night's meeting. Then sometimes I'd take him too quick. And he'd say, you could let me stay a little longer. And, oh, it was just a hard time. But what a wonderful time. I've seen the people just, any disease. I was thinking the other night, you know, you watch the news. They call this disease that. and They, they change the name, but it's all the devil. It's all the devil. But when the angel met him, he said, if you get the people to believe you, nothing will stand before your prayer, not even cancer. And I'm a witness to you today that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And not one time from that time in that room when I saw that angel that I could always tell you, not Brother Billy, but that presence. I could tell when he was near. Even before Daddy would say, you know what, I'm waiting for something. I might be down the audience working the prayer line, ushering, whatever I might be doing, but I could tell exactly when that angel come to the platform. Before Dad sometimes even said, he said, he's here. Well, I knew he was. So it didn't make a difference what disease this was. I knew when they left, it's going to be well. But he said, if you get the people to believe you, and I was telling someone the other day, I said, I've seen him bring him in well and they sit there and make fun and they pack them out dead i seen them pack them out paralyzed and i seen them bring them in on a stretcher and they would be dead and i seen them walk out alive and well only believe so i just wanted to say god bless you brother branham if these walls could talk they were talking to me today played for him in Phoenix, the other, what used to be the Ramada Inn up there. And if those walls could talk. But I'm going to tell you what he told me just a few months before the Lord took him home. Today as I was leaving Phoenix to come down here, I took a, an associate to the airport and I had to drive down Van Buren in Phoenix. Some of you know where it's at. And I saw the place where there used to be a little cafeteria. And on the last Sunday afternoon of the crusade in Phoenix, Brother Branham walked over to the organ after service. He said, son, would you like to go to lunch with me? I'd seen him many times in different places and was privileged to be with him, but that was a joy. Man, my heart almost jumped out of my chest. Oh, yes, Brother Branham. I think I was 19. I got off the organ. We went and got in this car, and it wasn't a big fancy Cadillac or limousine like some of these preachers have to have today. God love them. I'll leave that alone. Anyway, uh, we got in this car, and he drove to this little cafeteria, and we get out of the car, and he says, come here, I want to show you something. He puts the key in the trunk, and he opens it up, and to my shock, he has a gun case in there. How many of some preachers carry gun? No, I'll leave that alone. Uh, <laughs> it was a hunting rifle. <laughs> it was a 30-30 Winchester. He took it out and handed it to me. He said, the Winchester company just mailed this to me. And it had his name in gold on the butt of Brother William Branham. I felt like almost like I was touching the Ark of the Covenant. You know, I didn't know what to do with it. I knew I didn't know how to shoot it, and, uh, but I knew it was special. I knew he liked to go deer hunting once in a while. I had some minister friends used to go hunting with him. And I told him, I said, Brother Branham, I, I heard about those, those times that you like to go hunting, and Brother so-and-so and Brother so-and-so went with you. And, oh, yes, I know those brothers. Am I mistaken, or didn't your dad go hunting with him a couple times? Seemed like it was. Yeah, yeah, up in Colorado somewhere. Anyway, we went on in the restaurant. Here's what I'm supposed to be telling, so for, forget everything else. This is the beginning. <laughs> Uh, we went on in the restaurant, got our food, and we sat down. Now, I'm ashamed to say this, but can I just tell it like it is? You haven't heard a preacher really. No, I shouldn't say that. 
uh, I'm just going to tell the truth tonight. <laughs> I had in my mind that if Brother Branham would hire me for an advance man, why, I could really make him have big crusades. You know, this is my carnal brain. I had helped a few preachers put some ads in the paper and some radio spots on, and I thought that I had the answers to every preacher's advertising campaign, including your dad's. <laughs> he straightened me out in a hurry. But Brother Branham, he was sitting there, and I said, Brother Branham, you know, you're only 50 years old. You've got plenty of energy. You've just been hunting. If you just have the right promotion you could have the biggest crusades you've ever had. And he looked at me and smiled and dropped his head. And he said, no, son. He said, you see, that's not the way God planned it. That really wasn't what I wanted to hear. But I mean, how do you tell William Branham that's not what you want to hear? He was speaking for God. And I was listening to my old carnal brain. I said, what do you mean, Brother Branham? He said, well, you see, God's through with me. And I almost fell off my seat. I said, what do you mean about that? You've you, you got many years left. He said, well, my season has come to a close. And he went on to explain how he'd been a part of a great season of healing revivals. And he mentioned all the voice of healing preachers, or many of them. And he mentioned Brother Allen, and he, he had been in some of my father's meetings, and he was kind to mention Dad. Dad had a great Holy Ghost man. He and my mother could get more people through the baptism than, than uh, Elvis Presley could get in this concert. Amen. <laughs> Whatever that means. But sometimes 1,500 people get the baptism because they had a love to see people get the Holy Ghost. I haven't heard a preacher on TV even talk about getting the baptism in a long time. Maybe you did. I hope so. But we need that Holy Ghost. We need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I'm not just talking about talking in tongues. That's wonderful. We're going to have to walk in the Spirit if we get the job done. Anyway, help me, Jesus. Brother Branham said it. I've been in a season. We laid hands on people one at a time, and we saw blind eyes open and cancers disappear, and the lame walk, and oh, it was wonderful. But he said, Another season is coming. And in this season, it's going to be teaching and revelation of the Word and of Jesus Christ and who we are in Him and who He is in us. Not just Jesus hanging on the cross. That's wonderful. But religion will leave Him on the cross. Oh, I, I can't preach. I've got to stop. He, he said... It's about Jesus and us and us and Him. And he said, this season will go for a while and then it'll come to a close and God is going to take every move of God that we've heard of in history and even what we've witnessed and what we saw in Bible days and put it all together in one great Holy Ghost bomb and drop it on planet Earth and the nations will rock and reel with the power of God like they've never seen. And prime time news... Not the late night talk gab shows that love to lie about preachers. The prime time news will show the dead being raised and limbs created and eyes put back in eye sockets and arms stretching out. And, and preachers won't lay their hands on them like we did because they can't. There'll be so many people that no auditorium and no church and no arena will hold the people in no tent. He said they'll either stand in an open field and You'll look, I got a video on my computer they sent me from Africa. The camera's behind the stage. And four and a half million people are in front of the stage. The biggest crowd in history for any event. Elvis Presley, none of them ever had four and a half million. But here's four and a half million people praising God. And the camera comes up high on a helicopter. And it looks out at that sea of people and the sunset is in the end. And it starts driving. <laughs> and it goes over people and people as far as you can see and as wide as you can see. And it keeps on going. For about 10 minutes, that helicopter had to travel to get to the end of the crowd. I never saw nothing like it. I got up from my computer and I didn't even have no music. But I start praising God. I never thought I'd see it in my lifetime. You don't know what I'm talking about. You 
it's going to happen in America, brother. Get back to my story. Brother Branham, he said, God is going to bring the ministry of the apostles and the prophets to the forefront. How many of you can remember when you never heard the word apostle or prophet in your churches? All you heard was pastors and teachers and evangelists. It's because they'd been pushed in the background. But Jesus said, I didn't say it. William Branham didn't say it. Jesus said that his church would be founded upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ the head. It's a five-fold ministry in the body of Christ. God's bringing them forth to the forefront. But he said they will have the mind of God and the heart of God and the voice of God and when they speak their words will become the words of God they won't say what man says they won't say what denominations say or tradition or any of that they will speak as the oracle of God and they won't just speak about the future anybody who reads the Bible can do that you don't even have to have the Holy Ghost talk about the future we got a lot of people running around calling themselves a prophet. They paid $10 down at the print shop for a little card, said, I'm a prophet. If you don't believe it, they'll give you one. But that don't make you a prophet. And when they speak as the oracle of God, whatever they say, God will create it because it will be his mind and his will and his word, and it won't be about them, it'll be about him. Hallelujah. Do you see it? A momentary consideration of church history will prove how accurate this thought is. In the Dark Ages, the Word was almost entirely lost to the people. But God sent Luther with the Word. The Lutherans spoke for God at that time. But they organized, and again the pure Word was lost for organization tends toward dogma and creeds, and not simple Word. They could no longer speak for God. Then God sent Wesley, and he was the voice with the word in his day. The people who took his revelation from God became the living epistles read and known of all men for their generation. When the Methodists failed, God raised up others and so it has gone on through the years. Until in this last day, there is again another people in the land who under their messenger will be the final voice to the final age. Yes, sir. The church is no longer the mouthpiece of God. It is its own mouthpiece, so God is turning on her. He will confound her through the prophet and the bride, for the voice of God will be in her. Yes, it is, for it says in the last chapter of Revelation, verse 17, The Spirit and the bride say, Come. Once more the world will hear direct from God as at Pentecost. But of course that word bride will be repudiated as in the first age. 